time. You can never have enough of it. One day, you will have a full head of hair, and then the next day, it's gone. You can go from young to old in seconds, months will fly past you in an instant, and for the year 2099, I will have uploaded four new videos. Truly, time is a thing that exists. I mean, time's in everything. It's in your cooking tutorials, it's in your walls, it's in your sewers, it's in your music, it's in your movies, and of course, it's in your games. Time Splitters, Ocarina of Time, Mario's Time Machine, Blink's The Time Sweeper, The New York Times Crossword, and my personal favorite, Spider-Man, Edge of Time. What a weird intro, why did I write this? Spider-Man Edge of Time was released in 2011 as kind of a follow-up to Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, a game which had not only one Spider-Man, but four. Shattered Dimensions was the first Spider-Man game developed by Beanox, as the games previously had been on a steady decline quality-wise, and fans were ravenous for some good Spidey content. So with the pressure on, Beanox worked night and day to create the next big Spider-Man title, until in early 2010, they unveiled Shattered Dimensions, and everyone loved it. Seriously, the game was great, and in particular was held up by its strong premise of letting you play as four completely different and unique Spider-Men. Is that a cartoon pig? Huh? Well, you hop across different dimensions, having to fight strange multiversal villains like a female Doctor Octopus. I'll kill you! <laughs> Women. <laughs> the funny Uncharted man, and of course, what are you supposed to be the demonic cum. The game was showered with praise and ultimately was a massive success, pretty much inspiring Dan Slott to write the Spider-Verse comic, which has somehow led to Sony creating Into the Spider-Verse and their own cinematic universe with Venom and fucking Morbius. Anyway, once Activision seen the reception to Shattered Dimensions, they got Beanox straight back to work creating a sequel. And by straight back to work, I mean they ripped them away from their families and forced them to get something out little over a year later. Now given how little time Beanox had to develop a completely new game from scratch, they realised that attempt to make a Shattered Dimensions 2 was going to need way more time, and that would only anger their Activision overlords. So instead of creating a full-on sequel to Shattered Dimensions that would probably need like 8 Spider-Men to keep the fans happy, they opted to go with a slightly smaller game in scale which would only focus on two of the Spider-Men seen in the previous game, that being The Amazing Spider-Man and The Sexy Spider-Man 2099, known as Miguel O'Hara. This man fucks. But what would this mysterious game be about? Well, in October 2011, many curious fans bought a copy of Spider-Man Edge of Time, intrigued to see what this game had in store, only to find out it starts with Spider-Man fucking dying. Eddie! This... this isn't you! No! Choice! So the game opens with a fight between Peter and Anti-Venom. Uh, I should probably give a brief history on who Anti-Venom is. Eddie Brock at this point in the comics had basically gotten a divorce from Venom, but still had bits of the symbiote left in his bloodstream. So through convoluted comic book logic, these remnants of Venom become reactivated. But because Eddie previously touched Mr. Negative, his new symbiote is now white. Yeah, I'm sure that's how it goes. As Anti-Venom, Eddie finds out he can cure people of any illness, and I think he also finds God in this time too. Clearly this man is supposed to be a good guy, so watching him smack the shit out of Peter only adds to the list of questions I have. Anyway, as the fight goes on, Eddie drains Peter of his powers, making him look like he's had one too many pints at his local pub while he stumbles around the place. Concurrently with this, we see that Spider-Man 2099 is racing to try and save you, but unfortunately it appears like he's too late, as the next thing we see is Miguel holding Peter's lifeless body. And if you're like me, after watching that, you're probably sitting thinking to yourself, What the fuck just happened? This intro does a masterful job at grabbing your attention straight away and gluing you to your TV screen. I mean, to be fair, I know there's no way Peter is actually dead because he's fucking Spider-Man, but at the very least I want to know how the fuck we've ended up here. How the game actually starts is in a futuristic New York City during the year 2099 as we meet Miguel O'Hara, this time being voiced by Christopher Daniel Barnes, who previously voiced Spider-Man Noir in Shard Dimensions, and of course Spider-Man man in the 90s animated show. Don't you dare play that clip. On a real though, Barnes was the voice of my childhood and he's just as great here making Miguel come across as a cynical dickhead with his own brand of sarcasm. Unlike in Shattered Dimensions when he sounded like a 70s sitcom. That's me, ready to save the universe and looking good while doing it. We find out Miguel is currently investigating Walker Sloan, the head of Alchemax. 
basically a giant evil corporation, or Disney for short. He somehow came to the conclusion that Walker is creating something bad, so you stealth your way inside the building, being greeted by some adorable rats. Eventually, you find Walker and realise he's created a fucking time machine, with his plan to go back in time so that he can create Alchemax over a hundred years earlier and probably invest in Bitcoin. Miguel attempts to stop Walker but doesn't manage to reach him in time, allowing Sloane to travel back to the past where he somehow changes absolutely everything. Like, why have you changed the Statue of Liberty? Did you really look at it and go, hmm, you know what this needs? A fucking sword. Fortunately, despite Miguel failing to stop Walker, he does see a vision of Peter Parker's death, prompting Miguel to try and get in contact with him, which he somehow manages to do through a neural link. Science, I guess. Anyway, Miguel pretty much tells him he's going to die at the hands of an unknown killer. Uh, of course, we know it's anti-venom, but Miguel wasn't wearing his glasses, so he doesn't know that. However, instead of Peter hearing this and going into hiding, he instead wants to go and find his potential killer. I wonder how well that turns out. I should also mention Peter Parker here is voiced by Josh Keaton, who was previously in Shattered Dimensions voicing the Ultimate Spider-Man and was in the short-lived Spectacular Spider-Man show. Rest in peace, sweet prince. Seriously though, hearing his lovely voice in this game makes me a very happy man because he's by far one of the best people to ever voice the character, and obviously he's great here too. All of this leads into the main plot of the game as you play as both Spider-Men trying to fix the timeline and hopefully redesign the Statue of Liberty. Now at this point, I was actually really looking forward to playing through Edge of Time and getting a chance to see how the story unfolds. However, what I wasn't prepared for was the emotional turmoil I was about to go through while playing this fucking game. But first, ad time. It's a new year and you have a goal in mind. That goal being to become a peak physical specimen that can rival even the biggest Sigma males. And I have just the thing to help you. Say hello to AJ1 by Athletic Greens. Just by having this nutritious drink in the early hours of the morning, it transforms you into an absolute machine. Drinking AJ1 not only makes you feel better, faster, stronger, but it also comes with a ton of health benefits like giving your gut the power to fight off any unwanted bacteria. On top of that, the drink contains ingredients and nutrients, which gives you bags of energy, meaning you can work all day long because the grind never stops. Oh, what's that? You're vegan? Well, do not fear, my friend, because you can drink AJ1 on any kind of diet, whether that be gluten-free, keto, or even the rock diet. Personally, I take AJ1 because it helps keep me in the zone while I spend hours of my life editing rather than just collapsing at my keyboard due to a severe lack of sleep. So to start this year off right, use the link in the description to get a one year supply of immune support and vitamin travel packs free with your first purchase, and eventually you'll look just like this man. Now act one is actually really fucking good. Take that IGN. Honestly though, the first like hour and a half of this game is surprisingly fun. Guys, can we... I mean, that's amazing. Can we, I, I need a, can we add a little bit more? Despite the fact that you'll need a degree in quantum physics to understand what the fuck is going on. From a gameplay perspective, Beanox must have just looked at what worked in Shattered Dimensions and copy and pasted it into this game. But to be fair, I can't really blame them when they effectively had to speedrun developing this thing. Obviously this means aspects like the combat is mostly recycled from Shattered Dimensions. However, regardless of that, the combat still really works here, with Peter again using a sticky man fluid to create a variety of weapons, and Miguel using his fresh set of nails to rip apart all kinds of enemies, ranging from Alchemax robots to failed lab experiments. National Geographic suck my dick. Both these characters also feel completely distinct to play as, and that only becomes more apparent the more you upgrade them, unlocking some lovely attacks. Plus, both Spider-Men have different dodging abilities, with Miguel being able to produce a hologram of himself to distract his enemies, and Peter being able to... Matrix. Oh, and you can also cause a time paradox, which basically freezes enemies in place so you can punch them. There's just such a smooth flow to the combat and overall it's shockingly fun, at least to begin with. Sure, it isn't exactly new, but it works well enough here and gives you a ton of combos to play around with. Or you can just mash the square button. However, by far the strongest quality of this game is the relationship between Peter and Miguel. See, despite both of them being called Spider-Man, they really don't get along to begin with and their personalities heavily clash with one another. We're past that now! Look at the first search result! Peter is much more optimistic and honestly heroic, willing to risk destroying time itself just to save one person. Whereas Miguel is like your edgy alcoholic cousin. I mean, he still wants to stop the big evil corporation, but is really only looking out for himself, failing to understand the responsibility that comes with being Spider-Man. So a lot of Act 1 is just dedicated to Peter trying to teach Miguel what it means to be Spider-Man, and then Miguel just ignores him and probably burns his textbook. It's incredibly interesting seeing the relationship evolve over the course of the story, going from constantly bickering to a beautiful friendship by the end, where they probably go out for dinner. 
Providing Pierre isn't dead, of course. Well, we haven't been properly introduced. I'm the guy who's gonna stop your plans. Eventually, Pierre makes it to the gateway room, finding Sloane, a wild Dr. Octopus, and confronting Anti-Venom. It's here we figure out that Sloane has been using mind control on Eddie, and despite his best efforts, he can't seem to overcome it, which starts the fight we've seen in the intro. Now you'd think from how this boss fight had been built up at the start of the game, it'd be like fighting God himself, but honestly, it's just alright. I mean, all you really do is spam Peter's Neo ability until Eddie gets so sick of watching Matrix Revolution, he runs away. At this point, I also tried hitting Sloane here, but clearly this man is protected by the plot. Unfortunately for you though, Anti-Venom doesn't stay down for long, and he begins to drain Peter's powers. It looks like he's having a seizure. Weakened, you try to fight him, but it's honestly no use. Anti-Venom is way too powerful for you, and a defeated looking Spider-Man begins to accept the fact that he's about to die. Wow, what a fun game for the entire family. However, Miguel doesn't let that happen as he manages to save you, dragging Peter into the future, placing him in a healing pod, and then going back in time to fuck up Anti-Venom. Now, to the uneducated people out there, this may seem like a fairly dumb idea, as Eddie could just drain Miguel of his powers. However, Eddie tries to do this, but Miguel plays an Uno reverse card, and Eddie can't drain him, because Miguel's powers aren't radiation-based, but rather drip-based. So he proceeds to beat the absolute shit out of Anti-Venom, and removes the chips which are controlling him, giving Eddie some free will. Where he decides the best thing to do is charge straight at Sloane and Doc Ock, causing all three of them to fall into the gateway, breaking it in the process. Trapping Miguel and Peter in opposite timelines, leading us into... Now, if I'm being honest, I would have been happy if the game just ended here. 10 out of 10 for me, here's a game of the year. But then it would have been like two hours long, and Activision would have bombed Beanox. So instead, I spent the next two hours doing such exciting things like hacking computers, collecting keys, opening doors, awkwardly crawling on walls, and fighting so many enemies that I no longer have working thumbs. Act 2 is really where the cracks start to show for me. The gameplay becomes so boringly repetitive as you're just doing the exact same stuff over and over again. Sure, the combat is so fun, but when you have to fight the entire population of Poland, you become a little numb to it. I feel like Beanox must have realised this gameplay cycle would get quite repetitive, so they threw in some other stuff to break up the repetition. One of which being these freefall segments. They make me a very sad man. Miguel is just so fucking difficult to control during these segments, because if you so much as breathe on the joystick, he will be sent headfirst into an oncoming wall. These freefall moments absolutely do not work the way I think Beanox intended for them to, and are somehow worse than the ones seen in Shattered Dimensions. Like just one of these segments make me feel dead inside, so as you can imagine, Beanox has dumped like 12 of them in the game. There's also this concept called quantum causality, which is something I tried to research, but uh... It seemed a little too complicated for me. In the context of the game though, it's what happens when Peter does something in the past, which changes Miguel's future. So in theory, Peter could destroy something in his time, which would impact or alter something in Miguel's time. Here's a scientist to back me up. <coughs> However, in reality, all this amounts to is the game changing the environment you're in half the time, or letting these giant deep-fried octopus arms show up all over the place. Well, that's interesting. On a more positive note, from a narrative standpoint, there are still some really good moments between Peter and Miguel, with the most notable one being Peter forcing Miguel to save Mary Jane, due to him reading an article in the future stating she dies tonight, and obviously that makes Peter quite upset. Reluctantly, Miguel agrees to help her, thinking the whole thing is a big waste of time, however, in the process of saving MJ, he he finally starts to realise the responsibility he has as Spider-Man. Although, other than those standout moments, I feel like the story as a whole isn't that interesting anymore because all the tension and mystery built up at the start disappears because you know Peter makes a full recovery. And to me, it causes the story to really lose a lot of its initial intrigue. So to compensate for this, Beanox hired M. Night Shyamalan to write the rest of the game, adding in a bunch of twists like Black Cat appearing in 2099. But perhaps the biggest twist is Peter meeting Alchemax's CEO himself. I suppose Elon was busy destroying Twitter that day. <laughs> you know what? It's actually, actually yeah. yeah, it's revealed here that somehow a version of Peter in the past becomes a CEO of Alchemax in 2099, making him well over 100 years old, but thankfully he invented an anti-aging cream. Uh, I'm not making that up for a funny meme either, he, he, he says this. Too bad they didn't have access to the anti-aging drug we developed. <laughs> 
does wonders for you. His big evil plan is basically to harness the time energy from the collapsing gateway in an effort to rewrite history and probably bring back Uncle Ben. Our Peter clearly isn't a fan of this plot twist and swings back to the gateway, where both him and Miguel manage to repair it and get back to their correct timelines. However, Peter isn't the only thing to come through that gateway as we're introduced to Atrocity, a nightmarish amalgamation of Sloan, Dr. Octopus and Anti-Venom. I mean, I guess he's kind of cute in a melted marshmallow kind of way. At this point, I was feeling the strain. Like I knew the ending was in sight, but all the neon in the game had burned my fucking eyes out. Act 3 is pretty similar to Act 2 in the sense that you're running around, hacking into computers and plowing through so many enemies that my PS3 is having an aneurysm. The only difference being now is that you're getting stalked by this fucking thing. Great. On top of that, the gateway is starting to cause a time storm, which in non-science terms means it's beginning to tear apart time itself. Where's Doctor Strange when you need him? Peter and Miguel quickly figure out that Atrocity is weak to high voltage, so their new plan is for Peter to lower Atrocity towards the gateway, while Miguel reverse engineers it in his time, then Peter will push Atrocity into the gateway, thus destroying it and turning everything back to normal. Any questions? But of course, this plan is ruined when the evil Peter Parker shows up to fight Miguel in a giant spider mech. As we begin the final boss battles with Peter fighting Atrocity and Miguel taking on the evil CEO. Now admittedly, these boss fights aren't anything special, but I didn't care because I knew after this the game would end, which meant my poor thumbs could finally rest. As Peter, you use the electricity from the gateway to tase Atrocity. And while he's stunned, Peter does what any great chef would do and rips off his tentacles. Once you've done that, Peter sends him back into the gateway collapsing it on his end. All it's left to do now is for Miguel to send old man Peter flying into it too. Although that seems a little more difficult given how this version of Peter has taken the Spider-Man name a bit too literally. Miguel weaves in and out of pincer attacks, slowly but surely breaking down his mech, and without some good old WD-40, Peter is powerless to stop Miguel from booting him back into the gateway, finally destroying it for good. Once that happens, everything reverts back to normal. The Daily Bugle is back, the Statue of Liberty no longer has a sword, and the game triumphantly ends on this line. As it turns out, looks like I have all the time in the world. And in all honesty, as I sat in my room watching the credits roll, I had absolutely no clue how to feel about this game. The thing is, Edge of Time is 100% carried by its story, and more specifically, the relationship between Miguel and Peter, held together by two great performances from two fantastic voice actors. But the game loses all its momentum during the second act, to the point where it becomes unbearably repetitive, with certain aspects causing me to have a mental breakdown. In saying that though, there are a lot of people that claim this game is incredibly underrated. Like I recently watched a fantastic video by a YouTuber called It's Nick For Short, going over why he he thinks Edge of Time's story is utterly brilliant, and to be fair, he makes some valid points. But for me, this game could have been so much more if Beanox was just allowed more development time. Or you know, time to fucking sleep. Unfortunately though, Activision couldn't let that happen, because the second this game was released, they needed Beanox to get straight back to work creating a movie tying game for the new Amazing Spider-Man. I wonder how well that went. 